Father, we thank you for this wonderful day, Father God. We thank you for the life that you've given us, Father God, through your son, Jesus Christ. And thank you, Father God, for calling us back into your kingdom. Father, we thank you for the very presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives that continue to teach us every day, Father God, that just an advocate for you, Father God, to just lead us and guide us in your way, Father God, being the spirit of truth that we can follow and put our trust in and our faith in. And Father God, we just thank you for this wonderful time that we get to spend in your word. Father God, as we gather food from your word that we can eat in our daily lives that will cause us to grow spiritually, Father God, that we may continue to grow into that tree, Father God, a tree firmly planted, rooted in your word and in your kingdom, Father God, will bring forth life and life more abundantly. We thank you, Father God, that the fruits that we bear, they are lasting fruits. Matter of fact, they're fruits that last forever, Father God, because we sow into your kingdom. Father God, we thank you for the souls that you bring to us every day, Father God, that you allow us to impact their lives, Father God, for your kingdom. And Holy Spirit, just lead us in this study tonight as you but just show us what the Father God will have us to learn and how it would impact our lives and the lives of other Father. Bring us revelation and truth, Father. We thank you for continuing to cause us to grow, that we may be mature in you in Jesus Christ, Father God, and in your kingdom. We thank you. We honor you. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So hope everybody had a great day. Um, we're going to have a wonderful time tonight. We're going to have some good discussion. Um, I've got to write something down right quick before I forget it. I don't think no announcements for tonight. So we're going to continue in the book of John. Uh, last week, we had a wonderful uh, time. Uh, I think we finished up. We read our way down anyway to verse 21. And we're going to read a little bit more tonight. But we're going to go back and... Um, kind of add to our knowledge. And I talked about something to hear a little there, a little about God's precepts that we want to add to our lives and what, how it impacts our lives and how we should grow up in the word that we're going to not um, speed read, but we're going to slow down and, and talk about what um, God kind of impressed upon my heart for us to talk about tonight. So I um, want you guys, to com any comments about what we talked about last time? Um Last week, we talked about, we did recap a little bit about Nicodemus, and I want to kind of start there tonight, and the significance of his conversation with Christ and how that relates to us at this time, how we can see ourselves in that conversation. And we talked about, you know, as God so loved the world, you know, how he came not to condemn the world, but through Christ that everyone will come back to their original state in, in God and in Christ. And um, we talked about a little bit about that. That's where we ended at last week, somewhere between 18 and 21. And we're going to recap there tonight. Um, any comments on that? On what we talked about last week, anything that kind of impacted about his life, anything that happened that pertaining to the word throughout the week thus far, that a testimony? Okay, and you can share that throughout as we continue in the word tonight as well. Uh, let me expand my screen here for a minute so I get the background out. There we go. All right, and make sure my, excuse me one second, make sure my speaker is good. Okay, we're good to go there. So we were talking about last week, and I want to go back and kind of emphasize a few points to make sure we don't rush over that. So I was thinking about, you know, praying about what happened between the conversation between Nicodemus and Christ, Jesus. And looking at that from a different point of view, a lot of people, a lot of scholars and, you know, people will always want to say that there was a failure to, uh, there that Nicodemus did not comprehend what Christ said. Well, I'm going to do a spoiler alert. We're going to get there towards the end, way after Christ, you know, burial, resurrection, we're going to see Nicodemus again at the end. And you can actually read that in your own time. But here, you know, pertaining to us today, we see Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a man that studied the word. He knew the word. He 
was a, we talked about him being a Sanhedrin, uh, in the Sanhedrin council. He was a Jew of the Jews that, you know, Paul likes to uh, express. He was a teacher of the Jews. They expressed law. They, he, they were the main teachers at the synagogue. When people came forth, there was a lot of things that took place at the temple and the synagogue, such as we do when we gather today in our uh, place of meeting. And they would teach and expound on the word of God. They also had students, just like if you want to say in the church today, that will follow them. They were priests in a sense. And they also, you know, had followers that there were devout people that follow after their teaching. So pertaining to here, Nicodemus, you see Nicodemus, and to me, and I want you guys coming up, he really had a hunger. You know, we can look at the fact that he came by night and he concealed that. But the fact that Nicodemus, when he heard Jesus speak of the kingdom and the things that he took place at the temple and his words to the crowd, especially to the Jewish leaders there, and even going back to Nathaniel, you know, when they were there, he said, here is a true Israelite indeed. He said, that person that has allowed God to circumcise their heart, those who are really seeking God and waiting on the Messiah that really believes in God and God is sending the Messiah. And now he's here. But he had this wonderful conversation with Nicodemus about the kingdom. Now, here's a man that knew the word of God. And it picks out there at chapter three. He knew the word. He had, just like people today, we talked about that Sunday. He was in a, um, what's the word for it? He was in a uh, denomination, if you want to say that. You look at the Sanhedrin Council, you look at the Sadducees, the Pharisees. They were in a, they were a group of people that had a certain belief about the word of God. And they can quote it. You know, they impress it upon other people. They live a certain life. They dressed a certain way. They played a certain part before people. And even in the nation and they're in, in, in Israel and in Judea and Jerusalem, they played a certain part. And people looked up to them that they knew the word. They knew God. And here Jesus come along and Jesus says, OK, you have religion. You got you know the word, you know, the written word. But he tells Nicodemus that he's really not a part of what he believes is the kingdom of God or God's government. And we're going to do some, we're going to talk about what that, some plain and simple uh, definition of what the kingdom is, what a kingdom is. We talked about that Sunday, but, you know, Jesus here tells him that he's not who he think he is. He has the religious thing. They have uh certain protocols about themselves like we have protocols in church today you know it's amazing i was looking at the different protocols and we may go over that in a few sundays for now you know because i said some things suddenly about you know religion and christianity and it's amazing that i was looking at protocols every christian group if you want to say they have certain protocols or in other words their way of doing things and a lot of those protocol has nothing to do with the kingdom of god and we're going to talk about that either now or at a later date but here Jesus tells him, he said, hey, you, you know this, you are a teacher of the word, but you don't even know how to enter into the kingdom. You're not even a part of God's kingdom, his government. You're a part of man's government and the way they do things. Well, you're not a part of God's government. You really don't have a relationship with God. Matter of fact, you don't even believe in me. And he said that to him sharply. He said, you know, when he started talking to him about the kingdom, you know, you cannot see the kingdom and that have knowledge of, you can't have knowledge of the kingdom of God, how God's government, how God performs, how God, is, his government or um, order in his kingdom. We're going to talk about those definitions. And he said, and then he tells them how to enter in. How do you enter? How do you gain entrance into the government and the true kingdom of God that Christ actually came to deliver unto us? He brought back to us. And he talks about having that rebirth. And Nicodemus clearly didn't understand because he started talking about entering his mother's womb for a second time and all this stuff. And, you know, Christ said, well, wait a minute. You don't even, wait a minute. How can you know the word? The word talks about the kingdom of God, but yet you don't understand what kingdom is. 
you have all this religious stuff about yourself and your group. You have all these protocols, but it has nothing to do with the kingdom. And if he would just study, just like us today, we may have different protocols and stuff, even in the Christianity world, but is that kingdom, is that pertaining to the government of God in our lives? Because if it is, we're going to see tonight what it should do with our lives. So Jesus tell him, said, you know, you don't even, you a teacher of the law, you a leader, and you don't even know this. Matter of fact, you, Jesus tell him, you should know what I'm talking about. And he didn't know what God was talking about. So I want to talk about, I'm going to get some, some plain definition before I open those questions that what is kingdom? And it's hard for us to sometimes in this democracy that we live in, what is a kingdom? So simply saying, I'm going to give you three little definitions. A kingdom, first of all, is the sovereign influence, impact, and rulership of a king over a territory. Very simple. And we know the king, we're talking about Christ here, but it's the sovereign influence and the impact, which is a visual expression and rulership of a king over a territory. Second, a kingdom is a governing, because the kingdom has government. Kingdom has laws, has rule, but a kingdom is a governing, is the governing impact of a king's will and intent and purpose over a domain. And the domain is consists of that territory and the people that live there. So it's a real government. And thirdly, a kingdom is a king's influence over a people and a territory. Now they all sound kind of similar. And I hope you got those. So it's the sovereign impact, sovereign, excuse me, influence and the impact and rulership of a king over in territory. So Jesus, you look at Jesus was telling him that you're not, you're not allowing the sovereign influence of God to rule your life. He does not, you not allow him to impact your life. That goes back to chapter one when Jesus came and they did not receive him. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. They didn't want to hear truth. They rejected him. And they rejected his rulership over their lives. And we got to ask our questions, ask that question to us today. Are we allowing God's king, his government, the way he does things? We talked about the board that, you know, Captain Chuck had there. His, even his government upon society, the family, which that is the church, is the family. Do we allow God's influence and his word, the Holy Spirit, to be our guide? He told Nicodemus that you have to commit yourself. He talked about baptism. And he also talked about allowing the Holy Spirit. You got to be born of the Spirit. That's the bit. You got to allow the Holy Spirit to come and rule in your life. Not just come in your life and you tell everybody you got the Holy Spirit. But is there evidence in your life that he has rulership in your life? Kingdom. So that what he was talking about there. So anybody, any questions or concern about that before we read a couple of scriptures here? So again, God's sovereign influence and his impact on our lives, his rulership, this king, are we allowing Christ to be king and rulership over our life? Are we allowing our lives to be impacted by his will and his intent? Not what we and sometimes you look at even the Christian relationship, it's all about what we want. I mean, I was thinking about that the other day. We, it's almost like a need religion. Forgive me for saying that, but I'm explaining that. You know, why do we do things? Why do we serve God? You know, do we do it for his influence or do we do it because we want something? You know, I was thinking about that even in our prayer. You know, we always asking God. We always say, God, we thank you for everything. And then we have this list of things. You know, I think in my past life, you know, 
we try to not sin. Why do we don't sin? Because we want something from God. We think God's not going to pay our bills or anything. And, you know, he's not going to bless us. You know, I got to stay right with God because I don't want to lose his blessings. You know, we, we need something. We need healing. We need deliverance. We need um, restoration. We need, um, you know, it's, we need something. So we serve God sometime out of need, not seeking his influence and his will and over our lives, not his impact and rulership, kingship over our lives. And sometimes that's why we're afraid to sin. No, because we think God's not going to bless us. You know, he's not going to help us pay our bills. You know, and I was thinking about that the other day. God, he said, I'm the God of the just and the unjust. You know, whether we do think we're doing things for God, doing to pay our bills, it doesn't matter. I see him blessing people that are not saved. You know, he pays their bills. They're not going to church every Sunday and, you know, Wednesday nights. So we don't have to have fear of that. He said, all we have to do is seek first his kingdom, his government. All these things will be added. So I want somebody, we're going to go to Matthew chapter six. Got a hand there, Pastor Dave. Oh, I'm sorry. Bro, the Stokes, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, well, just, just speaking from the... Uh... <clears throat> from the comment that that you were making um you know uh about being afraid to sin because we think that God won't bless us you know even with that mindset you know and 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 I can remember back in the day when I first gave my life to Christ yeah that was the mindset but as you continue to seek you know not just the hand of God but the face of God you you begin mm -hmm. to understand mm -hmm. that um uh that that who you are in Christ and who he is to us as mm -hmm. our provider, you know, it, it's, um, um, this, this salvation is a, is a, a um, and sanctification is a lifelong process. But the bottom line is we grow in Christ as we continue to stay in the word. And, um, I have kind of wanted to comment earlier about uh, Nicodemus, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to wait on that until we uh, uh, I read a couple passage uh, scriptures that you have, but I just wanted to quickly comment on on the. Um, you can you can comment now yeah. if you like, or oh, you can save it up to you. But we uh, to yeah, well, I want to make it real quick because I, I do sure. do want to get through the study, but you know when when I look at Nicodemus and 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 the uh, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, um, there's a couple verses that pop out to me that uh, Paul had wrote you know, um, in Philippians and in, um, and in, in Romans, Romans 2, mm -hmm. it says, uh, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to the knowledge, you know, th their zeal was for God, but they didn't have that knowledge of Christ. And, uh, there's, there's also another scripture in, in uh, Philippians 3, 4, and 7 that, that mm -hmm. Paul wrote that kind of hits it on the head. Uh, Paul talks about how he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And if I could um, read it real quick, it's uh, Philippians 3, 3, 4, and 7. It says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church concerning the righteous, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me? These I have counted lost to Christ. And from what I gather, Paul is saying is that uh, uh, he was saddened that, that Israel, they had the zeal. Mm-hmm. And was driven by um, by a true understanding of who God is or what he wants from them. Paul knows from experience the traditions the Jewish religious leaders have and their exclusive knowledge of scriptures. To know all of that, however, and to know Christ is to know far too little. 
So the experience that that I guess to wrap it all up that I'm trying to say is Nicodemus, he had the zeal to know God. Mm -hmm. He didn't understand who Christ was and all of his teaching. And that was more important than anything. Amen. And it took something there. I mean, the fact that he came, my thing is the fact that he came at all. He knew that what he had was not enough. Not enough. Number yeah. one, he had to recognize that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we all, we should progress that way. We have zeal. We, and it's okay. I, I back up on that. We should, we do come to Christ because we do have needs. Number one, we in need of salvation. We know that what we're doing, the, the way, just like Nicodemus, he had to have been tired of what he was doing. You're in this religious organization, you're doing all these things. And then he came seeking truth. Exactly. Yeah. And you, like you said, there should be a, after we encounter Christ, after we truly encounter Christ, there should be a time of transition or maturity that we really learn to seek kingdom and yeah. allow the impact of the king to impress our lives. But sadly to say, some Christians still continue on that journey. You know, they come because they want God to meet their needs. We may not say that, and people may not say that, but I've seen people do that. They just show up at church when they need something. They show up, they ask for prayer, they got issues going on in their life. God need They need God to rescue them. That's not the salvation in his kingdom that he's offered, and we're going to see that tonight. He's going to do that anyway, but he asked us, even going back to the scripture, he said, first seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. Seek my government. Seek being in right standing with the king. Seek being in right standing with God. And then if we do that, all these other things, we don't have to pray for it. See, he knows that we're in need. He knows that we come to him seeking all these things. You go back to Matthew when he said that to his disciples. He said he knew what we think life is all about. He mentioned that. Your food, your water. Where you gonna lay your head, your house, your car? He knows that's the things that we have need of. So he knows that. But he's saying to us, hey, you know, I want you to seek my government first. I want you to allow my influence, my sovereign influence to be over your life, to impact your life in a certain way that you can understand and live what kingdom it really is. I want you to understand my true intent of God for you as a person, as, as a people for your life. So there should be a transition there. And he tells us about that, you know, even in Ephesians about the maturity of the church. So here, and I love what you said, because Nicodemus came seeking. He knew that what he had wasn't enough. But Jesus here tells him that there must be an exchange. If you really want to understand and if you really want to have a relationship with me and seek kingdom to come into the very presence of God, that why Jesus came to die for, there got to be an exchange. You got to lay down what you think is right, your religion, your protocol. And you have to, there's a way of entering into the kingdom. They're an exchange. We talked about that last week, being saved from something to something or into something. And I think for most of me, he saves me, <laughs> saved me from myself and this religious attitude that I may have. But he's saving me into a right relationship to God. What I understand now, what God wants for my life and actually what he wants from, for the world. So I have and, just a, a quick question. Uh, sure. Maybe somebody can help me with this. So the, the foundation, what Christ is saying to, to Nicodemus and he's saying to us, and, and even in the context that we're reading this, he is, is he saying to, to know the kingdom or the, or the uh, cornerstone is to know Christ, you know, to, to, in order to understand the kingdom, you must, is he saying you must understand who Christ is and how he uh, uh, relates to the kingdom? And I'm going to let somebody else chime in on that, too. As we know, Christ is the door. So he, Christ and his spirit, we talked about that last week. And that was a great question, by the way. 
number one, you only can understand kingdom that Christ mentions himself as the door into God's kingdom. In other words, to have a relationship with God and God express that, you got to come through my son. And the only way you're going to be drawn into that knowledge is by my spirit. The Holy Spirit draws us. Matter of fact, it makes clear and give us revelation so we can see. Number one, who we are, see that we have sin, that we need a Savior. And actually, it brings us to, to see who God is. It brings us to that knowledge that we need a Savior. And it points us to Christ. Anybody else want to chime on that before we read these scriptures? Just throw your hand up or start talking. Okay, well, let's see. Say, yes, ma'am. I just want to say that. I, I agree with uh, Brother Stokes there. Um, see, this king has a kingdom. Mm -hmm. And the kingdom can only be revealed to those who are seeking by the king. Mm -hmm. Because he's the only one that can give us what goes on in his kingdom, holding his righteousness. You know, a, a joy in the Ruach, you know. Mm -hmm. So, when we are seeking, when he says, seek ye, it makes me go back and say, okay, who is ye? Who is ye? We're seeking him first that the kingdom by the spirit can be revealed. Mm -hmm. That's what I get an understanding of it. Mm -hmm. Because the kingdom, because he, even John said, he said, behold, you know, the king has come to take away what? The sins of the world. So when 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 he's revealed, we're automatically by the revelation and by the spirit, we're entering into another kingdom by salvation. Mm -hmm. That's why he has to be always first. The king is always revealed first because you can't we can't just come up in there in his kingdom. It's his kingdom. So mm -hmm. we had to get ye. You know, and so that that's my understanding of because the kingdom is not going to be revealed uh, except by the king reveal it to you. And that's only by the spirit, mm -hmm. even our lifestyle, how we walk, how we treat each other. That's his kingdom, righteousness, peace, joy in the Ruach. And so that's my understanding. Somebody might have a different take on it, but I, I agree. I'm going to comment. I'm going to come to you, Pastor Ed. I like what you said. I'm going to just chime in on one thing you said. The spirit of God shows us what kingdom of also showed us what is right. And here Nicodemus knew word, but he wasn't doing what is right because he didn't allow the king's influence. And he talks about the Holy Spirit here. You got to be born of the spirit to show you what is right. If we even as Christians, if we're not led by the Holy Spirit. We make up our own righteousness. We just like Nicodemus, we think that these protocols and, you know, us being knowing the word, you know, is enough. And we're doing kingdom things. And I love what you said. We can't see kingdom of God's government, what he wants us to do or even truth unless we allow the Holy Spirit to show it to us. And if we don't do that, even as we use the word Christians, we make up things that we think look righteous we make up protocol, we make up rules and regulations, what we think God wants for us, what his government looks like. And it kind of does that. We're just like the Pharisees. It looks like a bunch of rules and regulations, but there's no life. There's no truth to it. That's not God, what God wants for us. That's not how he wants to govern our life. If you think about that order, that on that board that Catherine Chuck made, it talks about, you know, God, Jesus talks about the husband and wife, the children, that order. And it talks about the things that we, how we should act and behave ourselves, our code of conduct. You see, in most parts, we made up stuff. You know, we've gotten away from that. God's government, which is part of his kingdom, how he rules. And if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to teach us that, we make up stuff. And we get very religious about that. We hold dear to that stuff. And it's hard for us to give it up. 
And he's telling Nicodemus, just like he's telling all of us, okay, you got to give up all that stuff. All that stuff you learn and, you know, all that stuff you think you know, you got to give that up and allow me and allow the spirit of God to teach you what is true for you to see what God's true government look like. It's not what you and the Sanhedrin council made up. I'm going to show you what truth really looks like. Yes, Pastor Ed. But yes, uh, Brother Stokes, uh, my, my short answer will be, yes, you, you can't see the king, kingdom without Christ. Mm -hmm. That it's impossible. And I would just uh, like to submit for anyone that may be interested uh, they just happened to read Ron, uh, Matthew chapter 8 mm -hmm. about the Roman centurion. And you look at his response, you think, okay, here's a Roman. Here's what a Gentile that recognized Christ. Why is the Roman centurion recognized Christ? Mm -hmm. And Nicodemus seemed to be kind of going around the edges, you know, like kind of, okay, we know you from God. And see, that's one thing. Somebody can say, you know you this, but see... <clears throat> Nicodemus was inquiring, trying to get confirmation. The Roman centurion mind was already made up. Mm -hmm. He knew exactly who Christ mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. Because when he told him, just read through it and confirm me, if, and I'll stand correction if I'm wrong. He knew exactly who Christ was because he said, mm -hmm. you know, my servant is sick. So he said, okay, I'll go heal him. So now you don't need to come to my house because I'm a man on authority. I recognize authority. You can just speak. And my servant will be healed. Mm -hmm. That's a whole lot different from what. No, I'm not picking on the way Nicodemus approached it. That Roman centurion saw the kingdom because he knew that authority. See, we cannot, without Christ being the authority figure in our life, we cannot even be aware of the kingdom. Now, we can do a lot of religious stuff. You may even be a bishop or you may hold a high office in any religious organization. But you will have no idea who Christ is until you, we get revelation that he is the authority. He is power. He is the sole authority. Mm -hmm. That's how the Roman centurion, a heathen, knew exactly who he was. Nicodemus, a learned man, wasn't really sure. Mm -hmm. And I love you bringing that up because we're going to read a chapter before that, but I'm already there. He says, this is centurion tell Jesus. He said, for I am a man under authority. Having soldiers under me. And I say, one man go, one man come. And Jesus, after this, he marveled and said, I tell you that I've never found a man of great faith. Not even in all of Israel. So do we understand what authority is? What kind of authority Christ has and should have over our life? Do we understand his rulership? You know, and sometimes for a Christian, it's hard to see, but we don't understand what kingdom and king mean. You know, in this kingdom, God's kingdom, he's not a, what's the word? I mean, he is, he's not a president. We didn't vote him in. Matter of fact, we're going to see when I minister that and matter of fact, in the kingdom of God, matter of fact, he votes us in. He tells who get to be a part of his kingdom. So this man understood authority. He understood rulership. He understood kingship. That Nicodemus and sometimes us as even Christians, I'm going to use that word, don't understand. We think that it's a democracy in God's kingdom. That's why we can't see the kingdom. We can't see God's influence in our life because we're making up stuff. We're coming up with all these rules and regulations and we think we're righteous because we can pray for an hour. You know, and not there's nothing wrong with praying for an hour, but that doesn't get you in the kingdom. Yes, do God want you to be have a prayer life? Yes. But, you know, some people pray because I would say that need religion. They pray more of a need than praying for God's authority and for God rulership over their lives. And I know I tell all of us, you know, dude, I look at my own prayer life. You can see where someone's treasure is. And we're going to talk about that now in the next scripture based on how they pray. You know, this used to be my prayer. God, I thank you for this one. I thank you all that. And then all of a sudden, Lord, you know, you know, my family's in need, my children, my, my, my wife and, 
you know, no, no, Lord, you know, the light bill is coming due. And Lord, you know, it's a little late and I don't want my life turned out. And, you know, my, my, my rent, my mortgage is due, Father God. I don't want to be like, you know, that's a need religion. I'm not seeking God for his kingdom, his authority, his rulership. But God said, if you seek his government over your life, and if you line up with what is right, what he called righteous, you ain't got to pray for this stuff. All that stuff, the king, but just give you. So the centurion understood that. So he understood that if he came under authority of this king, he recognized the authority of Christ, everything else going to be all right. He don't have to beg. So I want us to turn to, oh, any comments on that before we turn? I want you guys to turn to. Uh, Matthew 6, 19 through 21. I'm going to ask a few of you guys to comment. Not looking for no right or wrong answer. I just want you to expound on this. So we're going to grow upon that tonight. So I'm going to call on three people after we read this. And, you know, once you just, there's no right or wrong. I just want you to share what's in your heart. And we're going to call some more people on that too. So in Matthew chapter 6, Verse, and I want somebody to read that. Verses 19 through 21. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. I want you guys to listen carefully. Now, as we read this, I want three people to kind of say what this means to you. How would you describe this passage what does it mean to you and don't get nervous i want to call i want to hear first i want to hear from jamie miss ohio miss jamie i want to hear from miss jackson katherine jackson and then also to tell it up i want to hear from mother eva what does that passage that we're going to read it's such a short passage but what does it mean to you in your personal life? What do you think Christ is talking about here? Okay. And then we're going to ask if anyone else after that want to chime in. Okay. How are we, Pastor Dave? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So this is Matthew chapter six, verses 19 through 21. Yes, ma'am. Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Mm -hmm. So before we have that comment, everybody heard that, you read it in your own Bible. So treasures here is also synonymous. He's talking about these treasures First, going back to heaven. So heaven is synonymous also with the kingdom of God. He's talking about his kingdom. So heaven, he's talking about in his kingdom. And think about what does, before you even answer that, I want you guys to be thinking about what does treasure mean to you? So we're first going to hear from, just in your own words, what does that scripture mean to you? Um, Sister Jamie in Ohio. She's not on. I don't see her on here, Pastor oh, Day. Oh, you know, came off of that? Yeah. Miss Jamie, did she run? <laughs> All right, let's go to you, Miss Catherine, Sister Jackson. How would you express that passage we just read? Ms. Kathy, I don't know if you're speaking, but you're muted. Okay, Ms. Kathy, is she going to unmute? Mom, you want to chime in as Mr. Kathy uh, figure out the mute? And just simple, you know, what does that kind of speak to you about that passage? Uh, when I look at uh, this scripture, uh, I look at verse, uh, I'm reading out of the Bible called the Scripture Bible. Okay. Um, 
And you said 19 to 21. Yes, ma'am. He said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So to me, what it's saying, these are earthly matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The earthly things that we, we think about or what we want because it ain't going to make it in. Mm -hmm. It's going to perish. That's what the word said. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then when I get, because anybody can come in, they can steal your car, they can steal your the house, your TV, all that. That's that's right here on earth. Okay, and it, go, it will rust. And it will be destroyed. Thieves will take it. But when it get to the kingdom of the most highest kingdom, because his kingdom is eternal, and his kingdom is marvelous, you can't just break up in there. Mm -hmm. So we throw up what's in that kingdom by, yes, our prayer and what mm -hmm. we ask. Because he said, thy will be done where? On earth as it already is, where? In heaven. Uh, thank you, Father, for healing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for eternal life. I, I thank you for my peace. All this nobody can take from you because these are king things that you store up in kingdom, you know, mm -hmm. in his kingdom. And that's what I, 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 I and see, they, if that cannot be destroyed, mm -hmm. or that's his kingdom. But he said, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in. Because ain't nobody breaking in that spiritual kingdom or his kingdom to steal nothing. Because it's been stored up for the righteous. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. The righteousness. That's where it's stored up for. Mm -hmm. Because ain't no, you ain't no thieves up there. That's sin. You steal. You just sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is what I get out of that. Amen. Where your treasure is, there your heart shall be also. Mm -hmm. So whatever we attach our heart to on this earth, it could be your house, your cat, your dog, your husband, your wife, your children. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. It ain't going to work. Mm -hmm. that's where what the word says mm -hmm. for whatever you uh your treasure is there your heart shall be also that means even in this earth it's like a form of idol worshiping a form of idol where you worship people or mm -hmm. you worship your car or you worship your wife your husband that's all that form of that's an idol worship to me mm -hmm. so and it, it, it's so much in there it's rich but you know, that's what I get for, for at this time. I digress. Amen. And any, I'm going to ask others to also express on that, but I took a little time to look at the Greek and Hebrew words when it comes to flesh and earth. And one thing about, it talks about the flesh, when it talks about the earth, it pertaining to the flesh or man's or man's system. It pertaining to the earth and man's system and man's ability. Things made by man, planned by man. What? Treasures here, it speak of, and of course, you know, that when he's talking about heaven, he's talking about the government, things of God. He said they're eternal. But treasure also, I looked in the Greek here, is the, the stored things. And it talks about in Matthew 13, 44 through 46, we may have time to read that, that treasure house is a depository. And it talks about a servant storehouse being in a person. <laughs> it talks about hidden, hidden riches within yep. a person. Talks about valuables, valuables concealed. It makes pertaining to the material treasure, which is earthly things, money and other valuable materials, possession and strength or riches. But it also talk about spiritual treasures here. These good treasures of the heart. Amen. Which is the innermost part of a man. Things that we put there. It talks about the holy uh, moments, and this is what this is really nice in the Greek. It talks about the holy moments that shape the journey in our lives. 
those moments, those moments that shape the journey of our lives. It talks about that. And we just read in Proverbs 2 um, that we're going to get in Proverbs 15, 6. Um, yes, Pastor Mitchell. I'm sorry, I had to, had to unmute there. Okay. And, right, I did the same, uh, I looked at the same thing with that treasures. It means, you know, one of the words is, is deposits. Now, mm -hmm. when in that passage, what is being written of is, well, a, a cross reference that for me to try to relate to what these deposits are, I looked at Galatians chapter 5, starting at uh, verse 22, basically to 26, and there's spiritual conduct. There's things that we do that conform, that show we're in conformity with God's order, such as I'll read the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace. joy, mm -hmm. peace, mm -hmm. long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Those things, when we display those and we live those and let those be driving forces in our life, those are spiritual deposits in heaven. Mm-hmm. Not material thing, which totally nullifies that prosperity message, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. what when Christ, what he's saying is, wherever your treasure is, that's mm -hmm. where your heart is. So if I am saying I am living according to God, you know, uh, his way, and, and I have not displaying these things, then my, my heart is in one place and I'm saying it's in something else. Mm -hmm. I'm in love with mammon. I'm not in love with the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Amen. So that's what, what God is saying, because we have to look at it reverse. What's more important for me, to have peace? or these fruit of the spirit? Or to have a big, big bank account, a nice how big house? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But see, it's what's mm -hmm. more, more valuable. It's a contrast. We have to do a comparison of where do we place the most value. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are these material things more valuable than the spiritual thing? Now, heart's in the wrong place. Mm-hmm. And we stored it up, and in eternity, those things mean absolutely nothing. However, the fruit of the spirit has unlimited value. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Priority. I'm and I like that we said, what's more important to us? What do we, this treasure, what do we hold dear? Even our beliefs, our personal beliefs. Do we hold and we're trying to store in this innermost man, the fruits of the spirit, and that's important to us as believers? Or do we allow what man says important, even in the kingdom, even, or when I say kingdom, even in as to, as the church, the church, do we allow those things to come in even to the church to be important, our house, our car, even what a man preaches, what a man says? over the word of God. What has we allowed in our storehouse? What's important to us? Because the Bible says also what's in our storehouse is what we're going to manifest in our behavior. Mm -hmm. You're going to know what's in that innermost man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got the greens. I saw a hand. Yeah, I, I wanted to um, uh, talk about uh, uh, Matthew 619. It's mm -hmm. now it says, I'm I'm just gonna read it again. Please. It says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys their all oh, and where thieves do not break in and steal. But where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we talk um, and this was the problem the rich young ruler had. Mm. See, because that he could not, that was, he could not, he had so much wealth. He couldn't let the wealth go. He could, I can't, I I, I can't let that go. I can't mm. release these things in the world that I love so much and just mm. stop and take hold of you. I I can't do that. Now, and, and when we talk about the kingdom, we, yeah, and, but ultimately in the kingdom, to me, what I feel, and when I see the pearls and the treasures that are mentioned that you talked about in 19, I think it is, mm -hmm. Matthew 19, mm -hmm. God is really the treasure itself. He is the treasure. 
is him we should be seeking and desiring and long after. Ultimately, this is why most high really, he created us, that we might have be with him and have relationship with him. And But he wants us to desire him. You know, you have something you love so much and you find this beautiful thing and you're so proud of it and you're excited about it. You want to share it with everybody. You want everybody to impart, take part in it and have a part of it. The mm -hmm. ultimate treasure is him. Yes. Mm -hmm. He's the treasure. He's the pearl. He's everything. He's everything. And when we go back to what you were talking about earlier in John, and um, uh, uh, I, I think Brother Stokes had, had mentioned it. I'll lose my chain of thought. Mm -hmm. But we were talking, you were talking about that. And with Nicodemus, what, what, Nicodemus understood where we read it. He got it that Jesus ultimately was from God. He got that because he said, no one could do the things you do. He said, at least you, you know, you were from heaven. You, God is with you. This we know. Mm -hmm. But what Jesus, I saw in that he was really trying to get him to understand was now you, you have to understand the Holy Spirit where he talks about the wind. When he's speaking yes. of the wind and we don't know which way the wind comes or from which direction, he's talking about the Holy Ghost now. And you can't understand God. There's no way you can, you got to have the Holy Spirit. The, the and this is what, what Jesus was trying to get Nicodemus to understand. And he was like, how is it you don't understand the holy things? You a priest, but you don't understand the holy things. Amen. And I like what we said. See, the rich young ruler, I like that. Because he said, I kept your law, what he thought was righteousness, uh, you know, kingdom, what God wanted for us. Since he said, I did that since I was a boy, since I was a child. But you're right, these other things, these worldly things, even the things of man, that you know, counselship, that became more important than, and I love what you said, the treasure is actually finding Christ. Jesus is the treasure. That's our way into salvation. That's our way into the kingdom. And he is a treasure. How can we seek a kingdom without seeking the king of the kingdom? He's the one that's going to have the influence over our life. He's the one that's going to impact us. You know, give us our intent and purpose of the king and what's of the kingdom. I want us to read real quick. Go to Matthew chapter 13, 44 through 40, 46. Someone turn in Matthew 13. I'm coming to you now, Stokes. So somebody go to Matthew 13. We're going to read 44 through 46. Stokes, I got you. Go ahead. I want to ask, well, how do we relate being wealthy with being blessed? Hmm. Two different terms. Well, to know that, we got to look up what the word said, what is wealth, not riches. And also, I like that because we don't understand what blessed it. Blessed has nothing to do with material things. That's something that we made up in our Christian knees, whatever Christianity. God says in his word what being blessed is has nothing to do with material things. And then riches... He tells us about what is what riches and I love where you say wealth. Wealth, when God talks about wealth, it has nothing to do with material things. And we'll talk about that. Now, I saw a hand to express that. Pastor Ed? Well, a, a short answer is uh, you can be um, wealthy and evil. <laughs> they, they don't correlate. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're blessed you are in the favor of God. So that's of a much greater value than having any of my, as a matter of fact, you, all the money in the world will not equal up, equal, provide the same benefit to a person as being blessed to God. That money, the money would not do it. 
Now, I agree with you, Pastor Dave, that it's been, that's another excellent question. The favor of God has been distorted so much to ignorant pastors and teachers and whatnot have equated material things to being in God's favor. That is a straight up lie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> being blessed simply means you had a favor of God mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. has wealth beyond measure. Mm -hmm. you, we can't put a price on it. Being wealthy is useless compared to what mm -hmm. God can provide. So uh, that that's a good question, but uh, a lot of Christians will probably disagree with that. Mm -hmm. But if you think having a lot of money means you're blessed, that may or may not be true. Mm -hmm. And I encourage you to do this. I'm not giving the answer for a reason. When you look at the word of God, God does never want us, is not talking about riches. He does not want us to be rich. God wants us to be wealthy. But I want you to see what that wealth means in the kingdom of God. It means totally different than a rich person. See, you can lose riches. And you talk about the rich man. Rich is just, you can get rich yourself. You don't need God for that. That has nothing to do. But it's truly a person to have wealth. That only comes from God. So I want you to look at the difference. And you can pull up scriptures about that. Use your computer about riches and wealth God talks about. And even when you go back to look at the blessing, what he means by blessing, highly favored of God, is the person who does these certain things. And those blessings, and he talks about in the word of God, what those blessings look like when they follow us. Others would see that, not about what we have retained, but it's something that will come from our life as a believer that people will see that we're blessed, not about riches in this world, but the things that will come from our life would impact other people. And true riches being blessed, is it, stop, stop, not rich, but wealth and being blessed, it really, God gives us things to bless other people. There's an overflow. Riches are things that you gather for yourself. We're not blessed, bless God, bless us for himself. God, when he talks about, I give you the ability to get wealth. That's not talking about riches. But he also, there's another scripture that talks about that, that he blessed us to do that. He said, you get enough to provide for your household too. But that wealth now is also, he talks about the knowledge of God the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding that wealth of knowledge as a pearl that comes from God. And that's what Solomon asked for. Solomon did not ask for riches. He asked for God's wealth, which pertain also to God's wisdom. And God talks about his wisdom in pertaining to wealth. It's the wealth of God's wisdom. He asked for that. Understand if he get that, he don't need the riches. But we do that in the body sometimes. We see, see the riches is seeking God's hand. God doesn't tell us to seek his hand. You know, and we have that one. I'm going to stop there. But I want you to read that. But, you know, he talks about, you know, and, and Solomon saw this. I mean, we want to see God move. We want his miracles. We want his riches and things. about. Why would we want that? If we get the wisdom of God, his true wealth, everything else comes. Matter of fact, we'll have so much that we are, it has to spill from us. That's wealth. Riches, you gather that for yourself. I'm going to have the barns, and then we'll go to uh, the greens. Hey, Pastor Day, I like this scripture where, where Paul talks about gaining Christ in, in um, Philippians 3, um, 4 through 7. Mm -hmm. And it says, although I, I myself may have confidence even in the flesh, if anything else has a, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee as to zeal, 
a persecutor of the church as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless but mm -hmm. whatever things were gained to me those things i count as loss for the sake of christ more than that i count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing christ jesus my lord for whom i have suffered loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that i may gain christ hallelujah Amen. and i like that because you think about it, he said when i don't have confidence in the flesh he's talking about his physical body mm -hmm. he's talking about the knowledge and the wealth that mm -hmm. the knowledge that he gained from yes. men and his teaching yes. gamaliel from the other uh sanhedrin council and everything that he was a part of he was talking about man's system pertaining to man's ability he's not putting his you know he even though he has all this knowledge and wealth of that he can't put his trust in that he can't put his faith in that Amen. things that were planned by man this knowledge and well so-called that he got from the sanhedrin council and gamaliel he said no uh, that's he was talking about the flesh he's talking about the things pertaining to man this knowledge and this understanding that he got and, and information from man mm -hmm. they, i can't count on that anymore amen amen uh, the brains? i i i okay i just want to say i feel that um i guess so what the question was can you say what the question was again <laughs> so i could just make sure i'm addressing this correctly the question was about um, wealth and and what was it? Oh, I guess we're just talking about uh, what's the difference between uh, wealth. She said riches and being blessed. I think was that it, Stokes? So yeah, Stokes? I, I just yes. Think yes. yes. Oh, yes. riches and being blessed. Okay, I, I think well, I tr truly believe that wealth or or prosper because the word says I desire that you prosper and be in good health mm -hmm. and and prosper as your soul prosperous that i think that's how i go it says yeah. i pray that you may prosper in all things and be in good health as your soul prospers mm -hmm. and see i really when god blesses us and i think wealth in financial wealth or wealth in in having many children or the good things god said every good thing is from him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we're not to love anything more than him see that's the problem the rich young ruler, he, he he loved the thing more than he could ever love God. That's why he couldn't follow him. We don't love the things we understand. We that's the whole thing with idol worship. Mm -hmm. We be you know with the problem is they were worshiping the trees, they were worship the rain, they worship the sun, and but they did they worship the thing and not he who made the thing. See, that's the thing. Anything that draws us away from God or what is the good from God, nothing is supposed to draw. We can't love anything. And Jesus was saying that you, you can't love your mama, your daddy, nobody more than you love me. Amen. Because when we look in, the, even at, we see how Joseph would bless, it, it, even where he sent, where his people went, they were blessed with they were blessed with everything. They had everything in abundance, overflow. Even mm -hmm. where people where they went into other nations, the nations were some they were blessed because just because they was there. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things, it's not we can't. God blesses us with the goodness of all things. As, and and I always feel like what he can trust you with. Because I was like, God, don't give me nothing that's going to draw me away from you. Don't mm -hmm. allow me to have mm -hmm. it. If it's going to cause me to, to pull away or turn, I, I don't want it. I, I don't want anything that will turn me or cause me to draw away from God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can't love anything more to him. And all, all good things, everything, our children, you know, whatever that good thing is, it comes from the most high. Hallelujah. Amen. And I like the scripture there because it said he wants us to prosper, gather things, even as your soul, so that's your innermost man. That's that yes. treasure. That's your mind, will, and emotion. That's that stored place. So Pastor Ed talked about those fruits of the spirit. When we store those things, those things bring forth a prophet. What kind of prophet are they bringing forth though? 
They're bringing forth goodness. They're bringing forth kindness. All of those things that are fruits of the spirit, when we put those things inside of us, those things are going to prosper. They're going to bring an offspring. Now, if you put the wrong things in your inner man and in your hidden treasures, and we that that was the first scripture read in Matthew 6. Now, what you think gonna come out? Cars, houses, that's all you about. Things that's gonna perish. Matter of fact, you're gonna the wrong doctrine of the kingdom of God, what things should be like, riches and being blessed. What those things that you have allowed to posit in you that you hold dear, those things are going to come out. But he wants us to prosper in the right way. As our soul, those mind, will, and emotion, as we mature and prosper in the right way, then he's talking about the things of God that he holds dear. Now, uh, Barnes, you had your hand up again. Then we get Mother Eve and we're going to close with that scripture. Uh, I just forgot to put it down. Okay, no problem. Mom? Sorry. I just wanted, I just wanted to say that. Uh... Uh, I do believe, and the scripture that comes to my Ruach is, the word says that the earth is his and mm -hmm. the fullness thereof. Mm -hmm. You know, even the herbs of the field. So if the herbs of the field belong to him, the cattle on 10,000 hills belongs to him, mm -hmm. and, and then so we can all live off the interest. Now that, that is just me for the natural setting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we have to remember that thing, everything in the kingdom has a priority. And it takes me back to the commandment, that very first one. Have And, and Sylvia hit on it, but this is the scripture that, that came to my Ruach. Have no other what? Have no other Yah before him. That's the main thing right there. And you have to put things in perspective. If I love money, it's going to rust and fade and go away. If I love uh, 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 my cause, my house, it ain't going to work. It's, I, everything is out of priority. And the most high have things in order. In order. He don't mind us. And I agree with Sylvia on that. He don't mm -hmm. mind us having it, but don't worship it. Mm -hmm. Amen. He gave it to us because the earth is his and the fullness of the way things begin to go wrong is, is we take it and it becomes what? Sin in our life because we begin to worship that we have what he's blessed us with instead of the creator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that that's what I get out of that. So yes. Yeah, and I like that because what's in the heart, you know, if you got the wrong doctrine, I'm gonna express that again. You teach that stuff. You teach, you know, you bless when you got a Cadillac, you know, you, go. you got a big house. Sure. That that's what being blessed of God, you know, mm -hmm. is about. And it's not about those things. Those yeah, things prosperity. will follow you anywhere if you seek the kingdom. That's that's true. You know, and you won't worship your things. They would not be important to you. It would just be a car. It would just be how it's a tool that God uses. You won't mind having people in your house to eat. Your house won't be so cherished that you don't understand that God gave you that room to bless people. You know, we don't want nobody. That. We want nobody in our car. We don't want to pick up it. We don't want to do this and that. Those things are the wrong treasures that we hold dear. Uh, Sister Catherine. Sister Catherine, you got to unmute. I think I see you there. Okay, Sister Catherine, do you have your hand up? If you are, you're muted. Okay, so while I wait on that, um, so I want to read this last scripture about treasure. So if you want to turn there, just write it down. You can read it later. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 13, very quickly, 44 through 46. We won't even express that. We just a close there, give you guys something to think of. Matthew 13, 44 through 46. When I read this, to think about what we talking about, the treasure is, those things that we store, those things are in the innermost man. Um, in those secret place, those, you know, what true riches are, valuables concealed within a person, uh, treasures of the heart. So it says here, and Christ is expressing what the kingdom of God looks like. 
He said, again, the kingdom. When we find the kingdom, we find truth about God, his intent for his government, his order, his way of doing things, his rulership over our lives, his influence, the sovereign influence of God in our lives, the king's will and intent for us, over us, his real government. He said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hidden in a field. The which when a man that found it, he hid it. And for joy thereof goes and sell it. All that he has and buy that field. Again, the kingdom, oh, and by that field, and 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking godly pearls, was seeking, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So that we gonna leave for us to ponder on. When we find the truth of the kingdom, God's government, his influence on our lives, are we willing to trade like the rich young ruler, like Nicodemus? Are we willing to trade what we have, what we think is right, what we hold dear, what we've been taught by man. Are we willing to trade what we have for such a treasure that that becomes so important to us that that's what we base our very life upon, that we go after for? And now everything else really means nothing. You don't have to run out of these things anymore because you found truth. And does that pertain to our individual lives? When we find truth, when God reveals truth, or when the Spirit of God, when we said that He shows us the King, He shows us truth, are we willing to trade our own doctrine or our personal beliefs or what we hold dear, those treasures? Are we willing to exchange those for the real truth of God? Or do we sometimes are religious? I know what my mama, my grandma, my old pastor, whatever taught me. I know what I learned from in the past. I know these earthly things, even taught by man, as Paul has said, that Tony pointed out. You see, I have no confidence in this flesh, the things that come from man. But I found God. I found Christ. I, through his Holy Spirit, I've seen truth in God, in his government, his influence, his kingship over my life. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful time we spent with you and one another. Father God, we thank you for showing, continuing to show us your kingdom, your government, your sovereign influence over our lives, even as we live here upon this earth kingdom. How you want to impact our lives, your rulership over us, Father God, your influence, your governing impact over our lives as king. Father God, continue to bless us, Father God, as we convene this meeting. Continue to allow your Holy Spirit to deal with our hearts and our minds. Let this just be an entryway for us to study, Father God. Even as we study all of us, what we talked about tonight, what riches and wealth is. What that really means, Father God. Pertaining to your government, your kingdom, your truth. That we may live the lives, Father God. That we may deposit those things in our treasure house what we deem important with inside, the true fruits of the spirit that we will yield forth the right fruit, love, kindness, long-suffering and patience. 
We thank you, Father. Continue to bless us as your spirit commune with us every day. We honor you. Thank you for protecting and keeping our homes and our minds and our bodies, Father God, and our very souls. We thank you in your precious holy name. Amen.